underlying psychological needs. Let's think about, you refer to the opioid crisis, for example, because I think even a lot of really good people are profoundly misunderstanding what's happening with the, the opioid crisis. Where is the opioid crisis happening, right? I've been to a lot of the epicenters of it, places like Monadnock in, in New Hampshire. Why, is, why are things so disastrous there? Why is there much higher uh, opioid um, addiction in West Virginia than on the faculty of Harvard, right? People on the faculty of Harvard have much better access to opioids, right? Everyone there has good health insurance. They have much better access. What's going on? The, the, some amazing economists, Sir Angus Dayton and Anne Case, did a massive study of this, and they said that we need to understand the opioid deaths mainly as what they call deaths of despair, right? It's not a coincidence that the places where opioid addiction is highest are also the places where suicide not with opioids is highest, where antidepressant prescriptions are highest. It's a whole, these things are clustering together for a reason, right? And you don't have to spend much time in those places to see people through no fault of their own have, are like the rats in that first cage, right? They have been deprived of the things that make life meaningful. This doesn't mean chemical hooks don't play some role. They do play a role. But I've been to the places that have solved this and it wasn't by thinking primarily about that. So I'll just talk about the reality of chemical hooks, if that's right. I think it's very important to understand in relation to opioids. So there's a very strong agreement among scientists that the most powerful chemical hook we know is nicotine, right? You smoke cigarettes, like my mother smokes 70 cigarettes a day. You smoke cigarettes. The thing you feel a physical craving for when you stop, which my mother would never do, is, um, is nicotine, right? That's the chemical hook. Um, and so in the late 80s, when nicotine patches were invented, there's this huge wave of optimism among scientists because they're like, oh, right. Cigarette smoking is an addiction to the chemical hook, nicotine. Now we can give people all the chemical hook they're addicted to without any of this shitty cancer-causing smoke. People are going to stop smoking, right? Um, so nicotine patches are introduced and the US Surgeon General's report a couple of years later finds highly motivated people um, using nicotine patches, 17% um, of them will stop smoking, right? Now, it's important to say that is not nothing, right? That means if you meet the chemical hook for people who are addicted to cigarettes, 17% of them will stop entirely. That's a big deal, right? That saved a huge number of people's lives. But obviously, 17% is not 100%. That leaves 83%. They've got to be explained by the other things. And that's really the factors that I talk about in, in Lost Connections. So, I mean, there's a whole range of them. But, you know, if you are acutely lonely, we are the loneliest society there's ever been, right? You are much more likely to be vulnerable to despair, depression, addiction. If you are controlled and humiliated at work, which most people now are to some degree, you're much more vulnerable to these things. There's a whole range. I go through nine of these, these factors in the book. But to me, the most important thing in thinking about the opioid crisis, and I'm, I find it really frustrating that this is never discussed in the American debate, is I've been to the place that solved an opioid crisis, that had a disastrous opioid crisis and ended it, right? And they did something that's very different to what Americans are being urged to do. So I'm a Swiss citizen because my dad's from there, so I know Switzerland well. And by the time you get to the year 2000, Switzerland is having like an opioid nightmare, right? Um, people can look up videos from the time, but, you know, people like Swiss people are obsessed with order, it's not a coincidence they invented clocks and all that shit, right? Like in their public parks, people like injecting in the neck, like Whoa. nightmare scenes, right? That'd be bad anywhere. But to Swiss people, this is like uh, their worst nightmare, right? And they try all sorts of things. They try the American way, arresting people, punishing people, shaming people. And it just keeps getting worse and worse. And then one day they get this... this incredible woman called Ruth Dreyfus, who I got to know later, who becomes the Minister of Health and then the president, the first ever female president of Switzerland. Um, and she explains to people, I think the solution is to legalise heroin. And she said, I know that sounds really shocking, because when you hear the word legalisation, what you picture is anarchy and chaos. She said, what we have now is anarchy and chaos, right? We have unknown criminals selling unknown chemicals to unknown drug users, all in the dark, all filled with violence, disease, and chaos. Legalization, she explained, is the way we restore order to this madness, right? So the way it works is, and uh, I spent a lot of time in these places, um, obviously, no, or uh, maybe there's some really hardcore libertarians, but almost no one believes we should legalize heroin the way alcohol or cannabis are legal, right? No one thinks there should be a heroin aisle in CBS. That's not the plan, right? What I did in Switzerland is if you had a heroin problem, you were assigned to a clinic. I went, spent a lot of time in the one in Geneva, the former president, Ruth Dreyfus, lives opposite this clinic. I think that tells you something. Um, like across the street? Across the street. 
what uh, what it, what it uh, so the way it works is she should move <laughs> well but if you see the clinic <laughs> i'll tell you why right so the way it works is <clears throat> You have to go to the clinic at seven o'clock in the morning because Swiss people believe in doing things really fucking early. It's a constant disagreement between me and my dad. You turn up, you go in, they give you your heroin there. They give you medically pure heroin. You can't take it out with you. You've got to use it there, partly because they don't want you to sell it on, but mainly because they want to monitor you to make sure you, know, you don't, don't overdose. Um, you use it there and then you leave to go to your job because you're given loads of support to get housing, work and therapy to figure out why you can't bear to be present in your life, right? So it's really important they give two things. It's important to bear in mind these two things because it's the opposite of what we're doing at the moment here. Give them the safest possible version of the drug and give them massive amounts of help to deal with the reasons why they need that drug. Now, when I, they're giving them the drug, are they injecting it in them? Yeah, they, no, they, the individual injects himself or herself. So oh. if, you, if you were the patient, I'm the nurse, I give you the heroin and I give you a clean syringe. And one of the things that really surprised me uh, at first I found really weird is they will give you any dose of heroin that you want apart from one that would kill you and there is never any pressure to cut back and yet I went there when it was 13 years after this had first started and there was almost nobody on the program um, from the start there were like three people who'd been there the whole time almost everyone does cut back and stop over time and I remember saying to uh, Rita Mangi who's the chief psychiatrist there well, well how can that be because we're told the chemical hooks take you over. You need more and more. If you had an unlimited supply, you would just carry on forever. What? How, 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 how do you explain this? And she looked at me like I was dumb. And she said, well, we help them and their lives get better. And as your life gets better, you don't want to be anesthetized so much. Which once that's explained to you is so obvious, right? But And it's worth just explaining the results of the Swiss program. In the it's 15 years now, in the 15 years since this began, according to the best scientific evidence, people like Professor Ambrose Uchtenhagen uh, have shown, there have been zero deaths, overdose deaths on legal heroin, not one person. There's been a massive fall in overdose deaths outside the legal program because people transfer in, because why would you carry on using expensive, shitty street drugs when you could be getting you know, help and given the drug for free? Um, and what is fascinating about this is Swiss people are really conservative, right? My Swiss relatives make Donald Trump look like Oprah. And yet Swiss people, after this had been in practice for uh, five years, had a referendum on whether to get rid of it. And 70% of Swiss people voted to keep heroin legal. Not because they're so compassionate, to be honest. That's not, they're not. <laughs> they're really not. Uh, it was because crime fell so much, right? It's much cheaper to How give some- How much did crime fall? I've got the statistics in the book. It's few years since I wrote it, but there was, I think, something like a 50% fall in street, street crime. Street prostitution literally ended, right? There was no street prostitution after that. Turns out women, you know, don't want to be on the street being fucked by random strangers for, for money if they've got, like, an alternative. Who knew? But the, um, so there was an enormous fall in crime across the board, and the police confirmed that. Everyone agrees with that in Switzerland. And all the kind of anarchy in the streets just, just stopped, right? But, but what, the reason I think this is really relevant to the opioid crisis is, what we're doing is the exact opposite, right? So they give them the safe version of the drug, give them help to figure out why, practical support to change their environment, to get out of that isolated cage and more into a life that's more like Rat Park. What do we do? If your doctor in this country finds out that you are using, say, Percocet or Oxy, not because you've got back pain, but because you've got an addiction, your doctor, by law, has to cut you off, right? If they don't, they can be busted as a dealer. It's happened to lots of doctors. Um, so they have to cut you off. So instead of giving you the drug, we stop you getting the drug. Most people then, or not most, a very large number, then transfer to much more dangerous street drugs like heroin. Secondly, far from giving you help to turn your life around, we give you a criminal record, we shame you, we stigmatize you, we put barriers between you and reconnecting. The opposite of addiction is connection, but what do we do? We put barriers between people and reconnecting. This is why, that's one part of it, right? So there's the drug policy part of it, uh, where we're doing exactly the opposite of the country that succeeded in ending its opioid epidemic. But there's something I think that's even deeper than that, which you really see in places like West Virginia, Monadnock, the kind of hearts of the, the opioid crisis, which is... We're also creating a society that is becoming harder and harder for people to be present in, especially in those, in those places. There's an analogy I keep thinking of. In the, in the 18th century in Britain, loads of people were driven out of the countryside into these disgusting urban slums in like London and Manchester. And 
and something happened that 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 has been well documented. There was something called the gin craze, right? Where basically shitloads of people just became alcoholics, drank gin until they died, right? There's a famous painting from the time called Gin Lane of a mother down in like a bottle of vodka while a baby like falls out the window, right? And things like that really were happening. If you look at what people said at the time, very similar to what they're saying now, they said, look at this evil drug gin. Look what it's fucking done to us. If only we could get rid of this evil drug gin, this problem would go away, right? We know now when we look back at the gin craze, it can have been gin that caused it because anyone in Britain who's over the age of 18 can go and buy gin, right? And while we still have some alcoholics, to be sure, we don't have mass epidemics of alcoholism. We don't have babies falling out of windows. What changed? wasn't the amount of availability it wasn't the availability of the drug the drug is more available now than it was then what changed was the amount of pain and distress in the society right we don't have a society where people are as profoundly disorientated i mean it's going up because we're creating more disorientation so we if you create a society where people's basic psychological needs are not met right where they have a shrinking number of friends and social connections where they're taught that life is about money and buying shit and displaying it on Instagram. Excuse me. Where they spend most of their time at jobs they find unfulfilling, controlling and humiliating. You're going to create growing pools of people who can't, and you, by the way, make you feel constantly insecure, financially insecure. Half of all Americans have, through no fault of their own, haven't been able to set aside $500 for if an emergency comes along. So you create this pervasive insecurity in the society you're going to create very large numbers of people who, who are going to want to an, feel a need to anesthetize themselves. Now, that's not a good solution. Obviously, I don't think heroin, opioids, these are not good solutions to these problems. But, but it's not a crazy solution either. There's a line I think of all the time. I, I, I don't quote it very often because people can really react against this insight. But I think it's actually important. You know, Marianne Faithful, the great, like, 60s British singer. She went out with Mick Jagger. Annoyingly, that's why people remember. She's much better than Mick Jagger. Um, <laughs> she, in her memoir, she, she had a heroin addiction in the 60s. She was homeless for a while. She has this very challenging line that I think about a lot. I'm going to phrase it slightly wrong, but she said, um, heroin saved my life because if it wasn't for heroin, I would have killed myself at that point. Right? Now, Marianne Faithful is not saying heroin was a good solution to her homelessness, but we've got to understand this drug use is happening because it performs a function, right? One of the most important things I learned for both my books, for Chasing the Scream and Lost Connection, is that these forms of despair, depression, anxiety, addiction, they are meaningful signals, right? They are telling us something. The fact that they have been rising year after year after year, in fact, we're now at the point where average white male life expectancy has fallen in this country for the first time in the entire peacetime history of the United States. That is a signal that is telling us something. And that's because of drug addiction? and, and Overwhelmingly because of drug addiction and suicide. It's, it's risen to that point. Uh, there are other factors going on, like obesity, but that the main drivers are... Um, O overdose and suicide and um, that is telling us something and what we've been doing up to now is we've been insulting that signal we've either been saying depressed people addicted people are just weak or we've been saying oh it's just a problem in their brain Th there are real things going on in their brains of course um or we've been saying you know it's just craziness um but in fact it is largely a response to the way we're living of course there are other things going on as well and we can talk about them and once you understand that, you realize there's got to be a deeper response. And I went to places that had done that, not just Switzerland. Um, Switzerland, what is the overall population? Five and a half million. So it's, it's a small country. fairly small country. Yeah. Um, how much money do they have to spend to keep this program going? And what, are the, what is the time constraints in terms of like how long is a, a person who's got an addiction problem allowed to stay there and, and receive treatment? There's no time constraint. You can stay on for your entire life if you want to. In practice, that doesn't happen very often. Do they often. stay in the facility? No, no. They, they live in apartments. So okay. they, they just, um, they no, just they, visit. They, they just go every day or whenever they want to. I mean, I think you can go twice a day. And it's free. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, I mean, some people, once they have jobs, then pay health insurance and the health insurance pays for it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have money, then they pay for it. Um, and one of the things that was fascinating is they found it was, in, and um, Joanne Set uh, did good, good research on, or cites good research on this. For, she did research for the Open Society Foundation. It's actually cheaper than the police constantly harassing people, putting them in prison, putting them on trial. Those are really expensive things to do. Heroin is unbelievably cheap if you buy it legally, right? Well, I would think that the amount of money they would save just in street crime being yeah. radically reduced. Exactly. It makes, it makes the life of the person with addiction better. 
It makes the lives of ordinary, of other citizens who are not addicted better. Um, and it saves money, right? Which right. is why Swiss people are very pragmatic. They're not, you know, the most compassionate people, but they are very pragmatic people. That's why it was so popular. But let's think about another place that adopted really different drug policies, right? Because um, I think there's something we can learn from there as well. So Portugal... Around the time Switzerland's having its horrific heroin crisis, Portugal is having a fucking nightmare, right? By the year 2000, 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is incredible, right? And every year, they were, like Switzerland, they were trying the American way, shame, punishment, stigma, and things just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And then one day, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together and they're like, oh, we can't go on like this. What are we gonna, what are we gonna do? And they decided to do something really radical, something no one had done since the drug war began in this country 70 years before. They said, should we like ask some scientists what the best thing to do would be? So they set up a panel of scientists and doctors led by an amazing man I got to know in Portugal called Dr. Juan Gulao, a totally extraordinary person. Um, and he'd run the first ever drug treatment center in, in Portugal, founded after the dictatorship. And they said to them, you guys just go away look at all the evidence and figure out what the hell we can do. So they go away for two years, they, they learn about Rat Park, they learn loads of things, and they come back and they say, okay, solution is we want to decriminalize all drugs, from cannabis to crack, but, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on fucking people up, arresting them, shaming them, imprisoning them, and spend all that money instead on turning their lives around. And interestingly, it's not really what we think of as drug treatment here in the United States, right? So they do some residential rehab that has some value. Main thing they did was a big program of job creation for people with addiction problems. Say you used to be a mechanic. They go to a garage and they say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. Again, much cheaper than sending him to prison, right? Uh, they set up a big program of small loans so people with addiction problems could set up and run businesses, the things that they thought were important. At the time, people were like, this is crazy. They're just going to spend it all on drugs, lunacy, yeah. right? Um, by the time I went to Portugal, it was, again, uh, 13 years since this had begun and the results were in. Addiction was down by 50%. Over, um, this is by figures from the British Journal of Criminology, the best scientific study of this. Um, overdose deaths were massively down. HIV was massively down. Every single indicator on problems related to drug use had fallen like a cliff, right? It wasn't perfect. They've still got problems, of course. But there was a massive improvement. And one of the reasons you know it worked so well is that virtually no one in Portugal wants to go back. I went and interviewed uh, a great guy called Juan Figuera, who at the time of the decriminalization was the top drug cop in the whole country. And he said what I'm sure loads of your listeners are thinking, right, at the time, which was like, if we decriminalize all drugs, we're going to have an explosion in drug use. We're going to have loads of kids using drugs. It's a nightmare. We can't do this. And when I went to see him, um, the audio is on the Chasing the Screen website. He said uh, something like, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. And he talked about how he felt really ashamed that he'd spent so many years prior to the decriminalization screwing people's lives up when he could have been helping them turn their lives around. Mm. And, and this is something that I saw all over the world, right? The places that have drug policies based on shame and stigma and the fantasy that you can get rid of drug use, which you can never do, um, they have mass really terrible and rising problems. The places that have policies based on, okay, let's restore order to the market and let's give lo liberty to drug users and love and compassion and practical help for people with addiction problems have declining drug problems, right? Again, not perfect, but it was such a significant improvement that support in Portugal, I mean, they've got five main political parties. None of them want to go back, right? That tells you something. Right. Yeah, now, when they did this in Switzerland, what was the primary cause for this drug addiction, and how did they deal with that? So if they dealt with it in Portugal with these loans and, 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 and helping out businesses by paying for half the salary and all those things, like that seemed like wonderful ideas. What did they do in Switzerland to sort of mitigate what are the issues – whatever the issues were that were causing people to be drug addicts in the first place. So it was a combination. They gave people lots of therapy. So I remember one of the people I spent some time with in that clinic had been um, terribly sexually abused. And there's a lot of evidence that giving survivors of sexual abuse safe places in which they can release their shame about that leads to a big fall in depression, addiction, and other problems. There's a lot of evidence that that, that kind of abuse is, is, is a big driver of a lot of addiction for a lot of people, though clearly not everyone. Um, some of it was just there were people who 
had never been given a chance in life or I had never had stable lives. Uh, it was kind of a mixture of things. And, and one of the things that's really good about the Swiss system is it wasn't saying in this kind of cookie cutter way that often, ha often happens in drug treatment in the United States, although there's plenty of good examples as well. You know, you don't arrive and they say, this is your problem. We're here to tell you your problem and how to solve your problem. It's very much guided by actually the person themselves, right? People who are in deep pain, the, the, the core of it is you have to listen to them, right? If we think about this addiction, depression, in the way that I'm arguing, that we should see them as signals that are telling us something, most important thing is to listen to the signal, right? I remember something I thought about a lot, I had this weird experience that I kept thinking about all the time I was writing my book, Lost Connections, about depression. And it's only quite late in, late in the day that I realized why I kept thinking about it so much. I was in Vietnam about uh, five years ago now, maybe a little bit less, um, and I did this really stupid thing. I was, uh, I was in Hanoi and I was really tired. I was doing research for a different book that I haven't finished yet. And uh, by the side of the road, I saw this big red apple, a woman selling it, and I'm shit at haggling, so I paid like $5 for this apple or something, and I, and I took it back to my hotel. I was so tired, I lay on the bed, and I start eating it and it was just gross, right? There was something really, it's chemical taste. It was like how I imagined uh, food would taste after a nuclear war when I used to watch those films in the 80s, right? Um, but I was so tired, even though I knew it was wrong, I ate like half of it and threw it in the garbage. And next, like four days, I was just like violently sick, right? Like just in it, like something from The Exorcist, right? <laughs> so I'm lying there in front of CNN and occasionally projectile vomiting. And it gets like bored. But I'd had food poisoning before. I basically lived on fried chicken in my 20s. So I was not new to this rodeo. And after about four days, I said to Huang, my uh, fixer and translator, who was arranging, I was there to interview survivors of the war, the Vietnam War for something. Uh, I'm like, look, I'm only here for another three days or whatever it was. I've got to go and meet these people. Otherwise, this whole trip would have been a waste of time. So he drives me like six or seven hours into the countryside. And we get there and he's lined up these people for me to interview. And I'm like, oh, God, I feel so bad, actually. I was sitting in this hut with this, this woman, who's an 86-year-old woman who was the only person from her village that survived the Vietnam War. So I'm talking to her. And as she's speaking, the, the room starts to... I've never had this feeling before. I've had a feeling when you're drunk, when you feel the room's moving. But it literally felt like the room was moving around me. Like, like I didn't feel like I was disorientated. And then while she's talking, I just like explode all over her heart. This oh, poor woman, no. right? From both ends, like fucking horror show, right? And so I say to Huang, just, <sighs> just take me back, to, put me in the car, take me back to Hanoi, right? And he's, this old woman's like saying something to him and I'm just like lying there. And he says, um, she says, you've got to go to the hospital, you're really sick. And I'm like, no, no, I just need to go back to the hotel. And he said, Johan, this is the only woman who survived the Vietnam War in this village. I'm going to listen to her health advice over yours. We're going to the hospital. So we go to this hospital where I'm pretty sure I was the only European who'd ever been treated. They take me in and Huang's like completely lying, going like, this is an important Westerner. It will disgrace Vietnam if he dies here, right? Oh, no. And so I'm lying there. And they're like j jabbing me with everything. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're asking me lots of questions. And I, I felt the most nauseous I've ever felt, right? And I kept saying to them, give me something for the nausea through Huang, because they didn't speak in English. And the doctor said to me, you need your nausea. It will tell us what's wrong with you. Right? And I even lying there and thinking, oh, that's kind of interesting. I also remember thinking, lying there and thinking, they figured out it was the apple. And I remember having, I remember having such a ridiculous thought where I thought, I'm about to die, right? I've been killed by an apple. I'm like Eve or like Snow White or like Alan Turing. And then I was like, you're about to die and your last thought is that you're basically a pretentious cunt, right? Like I was like horrified by myself. Anyway, the, they gave me this treatment and a few days later when I leave, I'm talking to the doctor and I, I was discussing various things with him. And I said to him, what would have happened if I'd... Um, if I had gone back to Hanoi, if he'd driven me back to Hanoi, and he said, oh, well, what happened is my kidneys had stopped working because I hadn't kept any water in for four days. So it was like I had been in the desert for four days. And the doctor said, oh, you would have died on the journey. You wouldn't have made it. And so I kept thinking about this experience, which weirdly didn't actually affect my like, worldview or anything. It's the closest I've ever had to a near-death experience. But all through researching my book about depression, Lost Connections, I kept thinking about this thing, right? You need your nausea. It will tell us what's wrong with you. And I realized... All the time I had been depressed, if I think about my relatives and people I love who'd had addiction problems, I had seen that my depression, their addiction, as a bit like that nausea, right? As like a kind of malfunction, right? Mm -hmm. Something that you should get rid of. And actually, what we need to do is hear it, right? Because it will tell us what's wrong with us, right? It doesn't mean it's a good feeling. It's 
awful, right? Depression is the worst thing I've ever felt. Uh, addiction is a terrible state to be in. It's not saying just in some kind of, you know, way, oh, we need to put up with it. It's that if we hear the signal, we can begin to find solutions. And all the places I went, the places that have solved depression crises that I went to for lost connections, places that have solved addiction crises that I, w that I went to for chasing the screen, are places that have said, actually, this means something, right? Your pain makes sense. You feel these ways for reasons, and we need to get down into these, these deeper reasons, which is really not what we've done in the United States since the drug war began, you know, uh, a century ago.